Fantasy tight ends make the best of us look like idiots. So imagine how idiotic your idiot league mates are going to look when they don't understand the tight end landscape this year. This is going to be a fantasy strategy video. We've done a lot of player analysis, and there will be a lot of player analysis in this, but I want to talk about the tight end position as it stands right now. We're going to break down real quickly, probably like the five or six top guys, like the elite options and whether or not I think they're worth drafting this year in fantasy, and then talk about maybe like five or six value tight ends that I think are probably worth throwing some darts at if you fade the position at the top end of it. That's all we got. So let's get them. Let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's see. All merch is available on icelunch.com. E-I-C-H-S lunch.com. These bad boys are available for pre-order on the site. Let's get it. So the first tight end off the board, of course, is Mr. Travis Kelsey. And with no Tyreek Hill here, he becomes weapon number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in this offense. I have no doubt that as even as this man is aging, he could fall off a cliff efficiency wise and still be dominant. And I expect him to be, you know, 85 to 90 percent of what Travis Kelsey has been over the last few years, plus uh, an uptick in volume. Most likely the problem I have with Kelsey is 90 percent of the time you're going to have to draft him in the first round. And 100 percent of the time, I am not doing that. I am not drafting a tight end in the first round unless you are in a tight end premium league. It's just not a strategy that I ever personally do. I do not like how my team ends up, how it turns out when I go with Kelsey in the first round. I don't like the roster strategy, the, the construction of your roster if you go with someone that early. So I don't suggest it to you. I don't suggest it to myself. So Kelsey, for the most part, is going to be off my board unless he drops to like the 2-6, 2-7, 2-8, and that just happens to be where my pick is. But that's also where you need to grab Mark Andrews. Now, Mark Andrews is a little bit more intriguing because he's going like a half a round to, to a round later. Some people who think they're sharp might be picking Andrews over Kelsey, which I can't get behind. But I've made the argument for and against Mark Andrews. He's obviously coming off a, a ridiculous year uh, in which he went over 1,300. Just things that you don't see out of tight ends. But again, my worry is this offense. Like we've seen how slow they are. We've seen how run heavy they are under Lamar Jackson when their running backs are healthy. Do we know if their running backs are going to be healthy? We really don't. So I think maybe they settle somewhere in between like the run heaviest team that they've been 2019, 2020, and what we saw a little bit of last year. So what I, what I think is like the volume of the overall offense will decrease a bit. And I think we could see like Mark Andrews drop from 150 targets that he saw last year down to like, you know, 115, 120, which would still be great amongst tight ends. But I think that really drops his production down to like a thousand yards, right? A thousand fifty receiving yards. And that's just not my subjective opinion. If you look around the web, if you look at prize picks, if you look at Bet US, what they have is Andrews' season long prop right now is a thousand receiving yards. Okay. I like to go to Vegas to to get an objective view of the landscape in terms of statistics. You could be like, Mark Andrews ripped off thirteen hundred yards. No way he doesn't do it again without Hollywood Brown there. And then Vegas kind of pulls you back down to earth where they're saying like we project him for a thousand yards. And listen, I'm not trying to draft a thousand yard tight end in the second round of a fantasy draft. So again, that price gets a little bit too steep for me. Next up, we got Kyle Pitts, okay? So at this point, I, I'm not drafting Kelsey. I'm probably not going to be the, the guy that grabs Mark Andrews. Do we want Kyle Pitts? He's, you know, he's a tight end three. And I like him a little bit more now than when the offseason started, but I'd still rather not rely on this kid who's still very young. He's still very raw. He's 22 years old. He's attached to Marcus Mariota in an offense that's going to be, as a Falcons fan, numbingly bad. I'm going to have to take drugs on Sundays just to get through those fucking games. And this, I, I mean, like the offense is, I, I would be surprised if this passing offense averaged more than one passing touchdown a game. Like if Marcus Mariota finishes with 14, 16, 17 passing touchdowns, I think that's a, probably a, a realistic outcome. Pitts is super talented, right? Coming off the thousand yard rookie season. But again, he did that with Matt Ryan and the majority of his production came in three games against really bad defenses. He literally had three games of 10 half PPR fantasy points or more. Three games out of the entire season, okay? So yeah, you can make the Marks Mariota with Delaney Walker, you know, reference. But like, I'm telling you, this Falcons offense, mobile quarterback, not a good quarterback, horrible offensive line, no run. Like, it, it's just not a success. It's not a, a situation that you want to buy a lot of players into. Everyone's like, oh, Kyle Pitts' touchdowns are going to go up. Yes, but this team is just not going to score a lot of touchdowns overall. So in order for him to get to like six, seven, eight touchdowns, he's going to have to have like half of the receiving touchdowns in this offense. Is it possible? Sure. Do you want to bet on it? Probably not. So again, Kyle Pitts, probably a guy I'm staying away from. 
up to this point. And then we have George Kittle and Darren Waller at tight end four and five. Which way you want to flip them? Up to you. George Kittle, I wrote really in depth about why I'm fading him in uh, in our draft guide, which goes live on Monday. If you want to cop our draft guide, it's everything you need for your season long fantasy football drafts. The easiest way to get it is by going to Prize Picks and using promo code BDGE when you deposit ten dollars for the first time. You're going to get ten dollars to play with. We can go nail that Mark Andrews over if you think he's going to fucking ball out again this year. Plus, they match it with a hundred percent deposit match. You put 10, they're going to give you 20 to play with. You put 20, they're going to give you 40, and you get the draft guide for free. So I went really in-depth on George Kittle. Again, I just think this is going to be a, a an offense that is bottom of the league in terms of pass attempts per game, and he's sharing it with Debo. He's sharing it with Ayuk. He's, the run game is going to be really, really strong. So I don't, I don't, I just don't think George Kittle has the ceiling that he's had or that we've thought about him having because of his athleticism. This is just not going to be a pass heavy offense whatsoever. And it brings the ceiling down of all these players and the pie is just not big overall for Kittle. So Kittle, another guy that probably not going to be drafting. If he falls to like the end of the fifth, sixth round, I'm okay betting on Kittle's talent overall. But again, he's got health issues too. He's got can't can't stay on the field. So I think that's another little bit of a red flag, but it's a red flag for everybody. I guess all, all tight ends kind of get hurt. But next up is Darren Waller. Darren Waller's low key probably my favorite of the elite options. I think he's just as good as basically anyone up there in terms of a talent, in terms of just being a tight end. He's got his own issues to deal with. Obviously, the biggest one being Devontae Adams coming over to Las Vegas and becoming just an absolute target hog in this offense. It lowers his ceiling tremendously for sure. Um, Waller is someone I'm just like okay taking in the fifth round because I know I'm getting a really solid player at a position that is really hard to get a really solid player at. So Waller is coming off a really down year. Obviously, he dealt with a lot of injuries. The offense was a little bit weird and he didn't live up to the hype, obviously, but I still think he's got ver- everything that he did two years ago. He's still got in his fucking body, and I think coming off a fresh start, a clean start with an upgraded offense, I think that will help him, you know, see higher touchdown numbers or at least be on the field more, more snaps, more targets, more routes when you add better players to the offense. This is going to be a quick hitting offense, so I think a lot of these guys are better in PPR because their offensive line ain't, ain't it. All right, so their offense is going to be tailored around a lot of quick hitting short routes. So Adams, Renfro, Waller, all going to see you know 100 to 130 targets this year easily, and I think it makes Waller a good PPR play. So he's more of a safer play for me, um, but I feel comfortable having him in my lineup where you're getting him in drafts. So after the top five guys, we start moving down to like the value plays. All right, my I mean the next guy up is Dalton Schultz, and Dalton Schultz is starting to go dangerously close to like George Kittle and. Um, and Darren Waller. So in order to invest in him, you have to be really, really confident. And I'm pretty fucking confident because all the same reasons I like CeeDee Lamb, you got to like Dalton Schultz. He's basically the number two weapon immediately in this offense because you have Cooper gone, you got Cedric Wilson gone, you got Michael Gallup, who's not going to see the field for at least four to six weeks this season. And this is a, a very pass heavy offense, a very fast paced offense with a very good quarterback. Dalton Schultz was the, uh, the tight end three last year. Okay. So you think of him as like a safe play, at least for the first half of the season, for sure. Like a very, very, very solid safe play, but he's got the upside. Like we literally just saw him finish as the tight end three in fantasy. So Schultz is another guy that I will have shares of for sure. Um, if he starts going ahead of like Waller and Kittle, I won't be pulling the trigger on him. But if he goes, I think in a lot of like normal leagues, a lot of like friends and family leagues, you'll see the ki- the Kittles, the Wallers go off the board in the fourth, fifth round. And Schultz would probably last like, you know, the seventh, eighth round. And I'm jumping all fucking over it. And then you have that like mid-tier pocket of like Goddard, Dawson Knox, guys like that who won't mind having them as my tight ends, but I'd rather either pay up for the guys in front of them who I think are a tier ahead or wait for a guy like Zach Ertz. Um, so Zach Ertz in Arizona was really, really high volume player last year once he came over like midway through the year, trailed only Kelsey and Andrews in terms of targets and receptions. And now Hopkins is out for six games. Christian Kirk is gone. Chase Edmonds is gone. Um, This is going to be a really, really high floor player in an offense that, you know, badly needs someone to throw fucking targets. So obviously they had Hollywood Brown, but they're not anywhere near the same, you know, running the same routes or the same position whatsoever at this point in their careers. You think Ertz has a floor that's, you know, as fucking as sturdy as marble right now. After Ertz, I'm betting on guys like Irv Smith who are really, really athletic. All right, we've been waiting for Kyle Rudolph to leave Minnesota for Irv Smith to get this fucking job. Finally got it. And then he tore his meniscus last year, but that's a, uh, it's a less severe recovery than an ACL tear. It's a six to 12 month timetable. This August would be 12 months. So that's at the very end of the spectrum, but all reports are saying that he's a full go full steam ahead, um, 
participant at training camp. So I'm all in on Irv Smith in a Vikings offense that's going to be more pass friendly and more up tempo, kind of like David and Joku too. I'm coming around to the fact that like money talks a little bit, right? Like they're really invested in this kid, David and Joku right now. They let Austin Hooper go. And realistically, they don't really have much in this passing offense. I know it's led by Jacoby Brissett for now, but if Watson gets, you know, a four or six game suspension, all the passing weapons are going to go halfway through the year. And David Njoku got the 40-year, $57 million contract extension, okay? It's crazy. This kid has been in the NFL for 10 years, and he's still just 22 years old. So his breakout is still looming here, okay? And they clearly, clearly really think there's something that's going to happen in his career here. And behind Amari Cooper, who's the new one, like Jarvis Landry's gone, so you have a bunch of unknown and unproven guys. So like Amari Cooper, Kareem Hunt out of the backfield, but other pass catchers, it's, you know, it's like Donovan Peoples-Jones, Anthony Schwartz, rookie David Bell, nothing proven there whatsoever. So J- Njoku could be this big play explosive guy that operates as the second weapon. Tyler Higby, I think, is another name to put back on your radar. I talked about him either yesterday or two days ago's video. He performs a lot better when Robert Woods is not on the field. Like his fantasy numbers are drastically different. So I think he's someone to put back onto your radar. Same with Evan Ingram, Jacksonville. Hey, hey, all reports at a camper that he's high fucking flying. And this is an this is another team that does not have a clear alpha in the passing game. So I think Trevor Lawrence will take a step forward without Urban Meyer. This will be a more pass friendly offense, a better offensive line. I think it's going to be spread out a lot. I don't, again, I don't think they have a true number one guy. So when that happens, you spread it out. You hit the tight ends, you hit the running backs, you hit some of the wide receivers, you sprinkle it all over. So I could see Evan Ingram like backing his way into 90, 90 targets or so. And you're getting him at like tight end 25 right now. I'm biking on Evan Ingram. I'm biking on him. All right. So those are uh, those are my thoughts on the tight end landscape as it stands right now. As you can see, I'm skeptical of the guys finishing atop the uh, the tiers. I think if you want to say fuck it and you want to be really sure about it, obviously Kelsey and Andrews are not picks you're going to regret. I just don't like building my team around early tight end picks unless you're in a tight end premium league. Uh, that makes the positional advantage just like sky fucking high over like the tight end eight, nine, ten. But regular half PPR are, are not leagues I I tend to invest heavily into tight ends. The other guys behind him, Pitts a little a little bit too early of a pick for me because I don't think he's like a tier above Waller or Kittle. And then when you get to those guys, I have my red flags as well. But I don't think you're going to be upset about getting a Waller into your lineup. I think he'll have his good days. I think he'll have his okay days. But the ceiling on a weekly basis will always be there with a player of his explosion and his athleticism. After that, we ripped through some of the, uh, some of my favorite value picks. And again, they were uh, Dalton Schultz, Zach Ertz, Irv Smith, David Njoku, Tyler Higby, Evan Ingram. Uh, the full list of all of my favorite values at every single position this year will be in the draft guide. It goes live Monday. Again, prize picks. Promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks to get it for free. Plus, play with that money on prize picks. But if you're in a, a state that does not use prize picks, you can always cop the guide on BDGE.co. Ike's Lunch for the merch. I love y'all, and I'll see you tomorrow.